Yo, what up? Hi. How you doing? Hello. I was I'm good. How are you? I'm chilling. I'm chilling. This is our first time speaking. We've never spoken before. We've spoken very, very briefly, uh, just via messages. I love your username, by the way. We're gonna have to ask you to explain that <laughs> a little <you>. bit. <laughs> explain that a little bit. Um but so I know you through Usro, but I wonder if you could introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Um, well, my username is BS on Blast, but my government name is Sarah, and I'm a Sudanese American who has been covering the war uh, for the last 256 days. Yeah, and the number there is is significant because you've been posting yeah. i think every single day multiple times a day mm -hmm. um yeah. and that's that's why i knew how many days it's been was because i looked at your post and i realized oh wow that's how many days in we are yeah so it's been a while it it it's has been a while over eight yeah. months now almost nine months yeah yeah so I think there are a lot of different directions we can go in here. And I think there's no particular agenda. Uh, really, it's mm -hmm. I'm going to throw some questions that you've answered before a lot. <laughs> and so I'm going to hopefully try to take advantage a little bit of, of your patience um, and, and ask, ask you to ask some questions that you have or answer some questions that you have already answered. Um, but then also, I'd, I'd love to get a little bit deeper and and just talk about kind of what's going on can you tell me about when when you started w when did you decide that you were going to cover this you, you use the word cover this but you also don't refer to yourself as a journalist i wonder if you could talk a little oh, no. about that yeah you know i find i find that really really interesting by the way but can you talk about why you decided to do that um well to explain that i'd have to go back a little bit uh, this is actually not the first uh, Sudanese event that I've covered. Mm -hmm. um, I've been covering these sort of things since I want to say 2013. Um, I've been active in covering and participating in the various sort of uprisings and popular revolutionary movements over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and so this is just the latest thing that I've been covering. I found that um, it's it's I've been most useful by doing the work that I do. Uh, and you know, this is I, I say I'm not a journalist because I I am benefiting from the service that I'm giving. I'm not doing this as a job. I am benefiting personally as a Sudanese person who needs the world to know what's happening mm -hmm. in Sudan who is dependent on the success of whatever revolutionary movement or um, uprising that's happening for my, for my own personal benefit and the benefit of my family. So it's not, you know, it's not a job to me. It's a duty mm. that I'm, you know, that I'm performing as, as a, as a Sudanese person. And so um, I guess maybe the, the, the most, the work that people know me most for is the coverage of the revolution in 2019 uh, and then the coverage of the coup in 2021. Um, that's, I think, what if you ask Sudanese people who know me, they will say, oh, we we started following Sarah for for mm -hmm. that coverage. And would you say um, you're oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> would you say most of the most of your audience is Sudanese people? Um, for the most part, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, that demographic is changing uh, with people started becoming more aware of what's happening in Sudan and becoming more aware of their role as people in a global community to mm -hmm. support these kind of causes. I think that's changing, but definitely in 2019 and 2021, especially when Sudan dropped back out of the world consciousness i think you know my audience has been has been majority sudanese i'll say got you got you all right let me see if i can make this thing work but i i think this is worth watching okay of the war in sudan and i'm here to give you a quick and dirty of what's been going on 
First up, some geography. This is Sudan. We are a country in Africa. We're bordered by Egypt, Libya, Chad, the Central African Republic, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. We had a beautiful popular uprising turned revolution in 2019 that was totally ruined by these two guys. On the right, we have, we'll just call him Burhan. He's the leader of the Sunnis military called SAF. On the left, you have, we'll just call him Hemeti. He's the leader of the rapid support forces called the RSF. I'll cut to the chase. They're both bad. Burhan is bad because he was part of the military dictatorship the Sunnis people revolted against in 2019 in the first place. And then after the revolution, instead of handing over power to a civilian government like everybody wanted, he decided, nah, I want to be president. Hemeti is bad because he's a psychopath. Before the fancy uniform and the fancy title, he was leader of the Janjaweed. If you remember the Darfur War, you know what the Janjaweed are. If you don't, then it is basically a militia contracted by the Sudanese government to kill people in Darfur. Fast forward, he is legitimized by the Sudanese government. They go from Janjaweed to rapid support forces. He gets a fancy uniform and a fancy title. He amasses mountains of wealth and has aspirations to lead. Up until they started tussling on April 15th, these two were essentially president and vice president of Sudan. Now Burhan and Saf claim that the RSF is a rebel militia, they're a terrorist organization, and that Saf is the one protecting Sudan. Meanwhile, Hemeti and the RSF claim that they are protectors of democracy, that they are fighting against Saf to rid it of the remnants of the previous dictatorship, i.e. Burhan. So on April 15th, the war breaks out. It starts in Khartoum, essentially, and then moves through cities and towns all through central Sudan and into western Sudan. This, by the way, is a map from October 7th showing the number of displaced people and where they were displaced to pause three. Now, earlier I said they're both bad. That's true. But the RSF is way worse. Over the last seven months, the RSF has been committing heinous crimes against the Sudanese people. Besides the indiscriminate killing and bombing, they've also been raiding and looting towns, villages, neighborhoods, homes, expelling people from their homes after they've raided and looted them, and then sometimes even moving. Sexual violence is also a weapon that they have often used in the last six or so months. And all of these crimes that I've listed are part of their legacy dating back to when they were still the Janjaweed. There is absolutely no way that I could list all of the devastating effects that this war has had on Sudan and Sudanese people over the last six months in a three minute video. And after practically six and a half months of fighting, SAF and the RSF are currently in negotiations and can't even agree on the basics. And why would they need to? when their funding is still rolling in and the world has shown it does not care. There, there is a whole lot to get to. Um, so, and that was what? Yeah, 100, 198 days. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think if we, if we look at the comments, which I won't go back to it, but if we look at the comments, there's still people saying, this is the first I've heard of it. This is the first I've heard of it. What this is the first I've heard of it. Um, where where do we even start from here um the first video that you made um when you're sh you're shifting from you know i'm guessing tweeting and you say okay let me make a video what was what was the idea there and did it feel like people picked up on that more or or tell me to it or tell me about that funnily enough i started making videos really okay on on day one, day one's update or recap of of the first day of the war was a video. Um, and maybe, I can't remember exactly when I stopped making the videos, but uh, yeah, I, the recap started, you know, on Instagram started with videos. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd write the, the, the thread on Twitter and then I would transfer and convert it into a video on Instagram because I thought people would engage more with seeing a person tell them the information. You know, they don't have to sit down and read it. They can listen to it as they're doing something else. It's just more accessible this way. Mm -hmm. um, but it just got really hard. Uh, the more the war progressed and the more crimes were committed um, and the more news was coming out of Sudan, it just became soul crushing to make the videos and have, you know, so little views on them. But also just on a personal note, I, it became very difficult for me to sit in front of a camera yeah. and talk about it without crying, without showing emotion, you know, trying to be as objective as possible, as informational and educational as possible. It, it was, it was soul crushing. 
uh, and so I switched to the the you know just posting the screenshots from the Twitter Twitter thread. Yeah. Um, the point to where I got to making these educational videos is, to be honest, I really I really don't know. I just saw people talking about Sudan and not really knowing what's happening, but talking about it in relation to uh, uh, what's happening in Palestine. You know, that was kind of like, oh, well, there's this other thing happening here, but we have no idea what it is. And it just seems so uh, far away. And also, this is an African problem. Of course, this is just part of the African legacy of like violence and unrest. So not worth paying attention to. And actually, the first vi video, public video, I'll say, I say public because up until this point, like I said, the only, the only people who are following these videos and this information were Sudanese people. Mm -hmm. by and by large. And so the first video that sort of got widespread attention was a video I made drawing parallels between what's happening in Palestine and what's happening in Sudan. And it was just three simple points about the violence, about the displacement and the disenfranchisement that Sudanese people are going through the same in this in a very similar way to what Palestinians have been going through. Of course, the context is completely different. Um, but you know, the, the oppressive tactics are eerily similar. So that's, that's sort of what I was, that's the video that kind of got people interested in, oh, wait, so what's going on in Sudan? And that's what prompted me to make that overview because a lot of people just had no idea, like none whatsoever. So I have a really interesting question in the chat, and I think actually this is a, is a good representative one, um, is asking for an introduction to Sudan. Mm. And what what yeah. a, what a hard question, right? Tell me about Sudan, <laughs> right? You know, like not a surprising one, though. Right, but but I not think a surprising one. It, it is it isn't a surprising one. Maybe we could even back up and maybe even personally, what what is your connection? Like what if what how? Do what you, is my connection to Sudan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> um, I would say. Um, I grew up the majority of my life outside of Sudan. I spent maybe um, four or five years in total as a as a child in Sudan. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we'd go back for for summers, and then when I graduated college, um, I went back and I, I stayed there for for a significant amount of time. But my connection to Sudan uh, defies that. It defies my being outside of it, it defies the borders, it defies the distance. It is, uh, the connection has been um, metaphorically beaten into me. <laughs> My parents did a an incredible job of instilling a deep connection, uh, relationship with Sudan um, that, that I can't, I'm so grateful for because mm -hmm. other kids who grew up in the diaspora don't have that same connection. Um, my parents, my father in particular, was adamant about me knowing, or about us, you know, me and my siblings, knowing Sudan on an intimate level, not just, oh, this is where you come from or this is where we come from, but knowing history, knowing deep cuts of the culture to, okay. to the point where when I moved back, I, there was a disconnect because I knew a Sudan that my parents had lived in and grown up in. Right. Right. And so I, I was carrying all of this history and all of this heritage, but also all of these cultural ideas, these customs that maybe no longer exist or no longer exist in the same way. Um, you know, things that uh, modernization had done away with or at least pushed to the side things that people th thought were no longer relevant to our you know our modern lifestyle particularly in Khartoum as, as the capital city but my parents neither of them are from Khartoum so mm -hmm. you know I, I also have this like these like village values and a village mentality that wasn't compatible in a lot of ways with Khartoum and so yeah. in, whereas in the beginning that was such a struggle for me and it caused a lot of like mental, emotional anguish of like, well, then what did I learn? You know, where is this place that I learned about? Where is this place that you 
convinced me was real, right? Where is this place that I thought I would just fit right into because I knew all the things. I speak the language. I speak Sudanese in a way that, like, I can't communicate with other Arabic speakers, you know, from the Middle East because my accent is so Sudanese. I speak a Sudanese dialect that is <laughs> dying out, essentially, is what I found out. Wow. You know, words that were not used anymore, words that people were like, no, you're making it up. That's not, that's not real. Or it was, oh, you didn't grow up in America. You can't speak like this and grow up in America. You can't think this way and have wow. grown up in America. You see what I'm saying? So, I, you know, I, my connection is that. My connection is I, <laughs> there was no way for me to, to not be connected to Sudan. My parents did not allow for that. And I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. There's this really gorgeous video that you posted uh, with your dad, also, which I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm a link in. Maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll look at it too. But um, I wonder if you could, if you could even take me a little bit further. What's is there anything? Is there any defining? You've mentioned language. You've mentioned words. You've mm -hmm. mentioned thoughts. Things like that. Is there any defining thing where if somebody said okay what is in your mind you know that you were taught what is Sudan for you you know uh I might get pushback for this but Sudanese people do community in a way that I have not seen anywhere else on this planet anybody else that I have dealt with I don't know community like Sudanese community and again like this is one of the things that you know even when I moved back and I, I, you know, we lived in Khartoum. Like I said, my parents are both originally not from there. They are from, you know, my dad is from a small village uh, up north. My mother is um, from a small village. Well, she would call it a town. I would call it a village um, <laughs> towards the south. Uh, you know, um, the sense of community, the sense of uh, who is family, is completely different than other places. Mm. Um, in Sudan, your neighbors are your family. Um, your third, fourth, fifth cousins are your direct family. There's no such thing as extended family in Sudan. Mm. Um, everybody is family in one way or another. And that's what makes, within the context of this war, that's what makes this so different and what people, I think would have a hard time understanding. When we say we're supporting people back home, we're not talking about, you know, parents or siblings or cousins. We're talking about the village. You know right. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a much, you know, supporting family has a much wider definition than in other places. And so, yeah, I mean, if you talk to anybody who knows Sudanese people, who has been around Sudanese people, they will talk to you about this thing of community. The fact that, you know, even in the diaspora, if someone dies, the entire community comes together, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, even the, within, the, within the context of like the funeral, there's a, a <laughs> it's a, an entire system that I don't think is replicated in the same way in other places. Uh, or exist in the same way in other places, I should say. Uh, for example, here in the States, you'll have a repast, right? And people will come and they'll bring food and whatever. And, and that sort of, you know, it's contained within a couple of days. Uh, in Sudan, it's a week long. The funeral is a week long. And people come and they just stay in the home where, okay. you know, the family, with the family of the deceased. Mm. Um, it's a, at once a, a a gesture of support, but also it's a very practical thing of like, people are going to come give their condolences. The family doesn't have the mental bandwidth to deal with these, you know, right. these waves of people coming in. So this is where the neighbors, the extended family, um, the friends take over. Mm -hmm. They make the meals, they make the tea, um, they make sure that there's a place for people to sit, a place for people to sleep. Um, where I, where my parents are from, this is like a 40 day affair. 40, right? four zero. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Al Arba'in is a very known concept in Sudan, 40 days. And then that's it. Then there's no more, 
giving condolences, then people go back to their lives. But for 40 days, you are in mourning and you are ex expecting people to come all the time and your family from outside of wherever you live is coming in all the time and they're spending a week with you, they're spending two weeks with you to give their, con that's how we give condolences. We don't just come and show up and leave, right? Wow. Now in Khartoum, like I said, with with life changing, lifestyles changing in the capital that uh, doesn't really exist in the same way anymore. So now, mm. you know, it'll be three days, right? A three day thing. And people don't usually come and stay. It's just the close family or close friends will come stay. But most people just come give their condolences and they leave. Maybe they'll have a meal at your house to show you how much they truly care. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, that was just an example of like how things have changed, but also I carry the 40 day thing. Yeah, that in my mind, a funeral is 40 days. And so when I moved back to Sudan and I would go to all these funerals, my, my cousins would be like, why are you doing this? My cousins who grew up in Sudan would say, why are you doing this? Why are you going? This is old people stuff. Why are you going <laughs> two, three times a week to the funeral home, right? To, to, to help out and give, and I'm like, that's, isn't that what everybody does? And they're like, wow. no, yeah, that's so old timey. What are you doing? You're not an auntie. Why are you acting like an auntie? That, that was what I would hear people say, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. But anyway, to, <laughs> to summarize, uh, yeah. community. I would say community, yeah. Oh, no. sorry. I just want to say something really quickly. Yes, Because, say. yeah, I, I mean, how community is playing out right now mm -hmm. is people who are fleeing violence in conflict zones are being taken in by complete strangers. Right, right now, the, the, the biggest event in the last two weeks or so was uh, the RSF's attack of the city of Medini. Medini is a city south of Khartoum. It's the capital of Jazeera State. It's where some 500,000 uh, people fled out of Khartoum to Medini in the beginning of the war, right, throughout the last eight months. 500,000, half, half a million people. Half a million people. Sometimes yeah. I just got to... At a certain point, you get you, you say numbers and they don't mean anything anymore. I, and you, so you, you, you know this better me. than I do, but sometimes you just gotta say them twice because yeah. maybe it'll sink in again. Like that, that's yeah. I've been trying to do that recently. It's just I'll say the number. And I appreciate you incredible. for doing that. I appreciate you for stopping me because I've I've reached a point where I'm just rattling off things, right? Mm. Because I'm trying to get as much information out as possible, and people don't mm. really pause. To think about what it means for 500,000 people to leave their homes. Yeah. Leave their homes and make it an, a considerable distance. I mean, Medini is not close. It's a three hour drive at the very least. Mm -hmm. If you have a car. Right. If you have a car. If you have a car. Mm -hmm. um, and so when the RSF attacked Medini, people had to flee not only the 500,000 who came to Medini, but also the residents of Medini themselves. Yeah. had to flee to, you know, uh, villages on the outskirts of Medini throughout Jazeera State into neighboring Sinar State, which is south of uh, Jazeera. And they were taken in by strangers. My uncle, who was working in Medini, he fled from Khartoum, he's working in Medini, uh, and his family was staying in a village outside of Medini, mm -hmm. where... Uh, so his wife's sister lives, right? They, are, they were staying there. My uncle had to work. So he moved into Medini, stayed with, just was just renting a room with a bunch of people. And when the RSF attacked, he couldn't make it back to the village where his family is staying. So he had to leave on foot and just stop at a village in the middle of the night where they reached and stay with complete strangers. Wow. And then move from, a diff from that village in the morning to walk to, you know, and I'm, I'm saying this, I'm not even sure of the distances, but this is not close. We're not talking about neighborhoods, right? We're talking about significant distances yeah. to make it to the next village over. And at some point, uh, you know, in their walk to safety, they were confronted by the RSF. They came across RSF forces who stopped them and immediately took their phones. And then they just, you know, they were lucky to escape with their lives. And they reached a village and he called his son 
by you know he borrowed a phone from someone in this village a complete stranger who took him in because they're displaced people who are who have nowhere else to go right he borrowed a phone he called his son to tell him that he was still alive and that you know he's in, in this particular village and my dad called my cousin who told us this information and it's been four days now that we have not heard from my uncle um but i say all this to say that Folks are relying on uh, this co- sense of community to survive. Yeah. And what we're doing in the diaspora is uh, activating the sense of community to support the people back home. And like I said, we're not supporting just our families. We are donating and rallying and mobilizing for the folks in displacement camps, people we've never met, hundreds of thousands of people who are in desperate need of help. And in the absence of humanitarian organizations in the absence of the, you know, these systems that the world has set up for this exact situation. Right. It falls upon us as, as Sudanese people to do that. And if we didn't have this sense of community, then those people would be, they would have no hope. They would have no hope. There's, there's a few things that I want to touch on what you just said. I mean, one of those, is I want to talk about the phone thing in a second because I think the phone thing yeah. is extremely important. Also yeah. keeping in mind that you said his phone was taken and yeah. then he called somebody. So just no joke in chat, your emergency contact. I'm going to actually ask you all this Thank question. You. In in chat, I want to actually ask you, there's a few of y'all in here. Type a one if your emergency contact, you know the number by heart and you could call them. If your phone is gone and you can give them a ring right now because there's an emergency. Type a one if you could call them right now. You got to go to a dial-up phone. You can call them. Type two if you cannot. Or give, give me. I'm a, so like, curious. Yeah. To I'm, know I'm because curious. I was telling my dad. I was telling my dad, isn't it a miracle that he memorized his son's number? I don't know anybody's number. I know one person's number by heart. I know, I know my dad's number. And the only That's reason, I actually, them. I know my parents' numbers. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I know them is because they need me to know them to like put it in at Walgreens when they need their prescriptions <laughs> or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, that's the only reason <laughs> so I know their discount. numbers by heart. <laughs> yeah. I have two brothers. I don't know either of their phone numbers by heart. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I, 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 man, I talked to my, like, if, if you took Discord away from me, I can't talk to my brother anymore. We're yeah. gone. That's <laughs> that's, it. <laughs> that's it. I I I really spiraled after I got that. Like after the initial relief of knowing that my uncle was okay four days ago, um, I spiraled because I was like thinking about myself in that situation. I would be dead. Who would I call? I would have no idea who to call because I wouldn't have no numbers. Yeah. Let's see. Um, it's about split. Honestly, we got we got some ones and we got some. We got some twos. Listen, my advice, memorize the number. Memorize the number today. <laughs> I mean, may you never be in a situation where you have to. Yeah. But yeah. But no, memorize the number. Though. Yeah. But I mean, but but these these are things that these are just the, the simple mechanical logistical things that people are having to think of. I mean, imagine a million of those decisions, a million of those things to yeah. keep in mind. You know, what is the address of this person? What is the connection of this person to this person? What if one person doesn't pick up? I might need, I might need to know, you know, what if that person got their phone taken too? Right. I don't, memorizing one number isn't enough. I need to know three or four. I mean, shoot, you probably know this in protests. You know, you know what people do is when people go out to protest, they write emergency contacts on their hands. You know why we do that is because we're not good at remembering numbers anymore, especially in a stressful situation. You forget things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, seasoned protesters will write this stuff on their arms, you know, with a magic marker or whatever, two or three, you know, the number of emergency contact, number of a lawyer, right. the number of whatever. And and still, you know, <coughs> it, it, this seems, you know, small and mundane. Um, but again, imagine so many of those small little adjustments that you have to make 
just in order to think, you know, everything seems okay today. Maybe it's not tomorrow. And here are the things that I have to be, you know, keeping in mind or whatever. Um, but there's, there's another bit of the, the phone part that I want to come to, but you know, you were talking about that locally people are having to come together and, and take Mm -hmm. care of each other, you know, also in the diaspora. Um, and you mentioned the, you know, the organizations which were set up for just such a crisis, right? And this is, this is Mm -hmm. to be really clear. I mean, the UN has been calling this a crisis. I mean, I, I, if if we want to do numbers again, I mean, close to five million at five million people at extreme risk of extreme hunger. Like, yeah. No food. Five million people. I mean, I don't know how many people in here are even from a town that has a quarter of that size. That is an incredible amount of people. Right. And that's just yeah. basic food basic food right um i'm gonna throw a loaded somewhat question at you why do you think it is that we aren't hearing more about this um there are several reasons Mm. um i'll start with the more uh I don't know what the word to use is. I'll start with the least offensive. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the least offensive reason is that the world is distracted. Mm. The world is distracted by what's been happening in Palestine since October 7th. Mm. Right. Um, and with great reason, what's happening there is a, is a tragedy. It's a travesty. It's a crime against humanity. Um, but also before that, the world was distracted. The world mm-hmm. was distracted by the war in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've seen how um, the war in Ukraine was reflected in the media, how it was reported in the media, that, it, that it's a travesty, a tragedy, but not just a tragedy because there's war and because one nation is, you know, violating another nation. It was, how could this happen? to people who look like us. Right. Not me, of course, but, you know, the us that matter. And not me either. Not a lot of people right. who are in the chat, <laughs> frankly. Right, right. And I, think, I, I think we should genuinely not ever forget that that's how the coverage started. I don't think we can, mm-hmm. like, I don't think this is something necessarily that, I'm not. I'm not even saying, you know, send hate mail to the reporter who said this because it was not one reporter. Oh, no. it was it was nothing like that it was just that this was a sentiment that made sense to say and and if that, we want to be real this mm-hmm. is a sentiment that people don't even realize that they have yes like it's yes. it's it was such a visceral reaction for for them that it really came out in my opinion it came out truly genuinely mm-hmm. they were genuinely shocked that this could ha- this that people who look like them could live like that yeah. or could be living those circumstances mm-hmm. because they had always been we've been conditioned like i said before we've been conditioned to think that this only happens in the third world this mm-hmm. only happens in africa when i think violence and unrest i immediately think of a black face i don't think of a white one yeah and so you know they were they were genuine in their shock they were genuine in their uh you know uh, being in being appalled because they really didn't think it could ever happen and so when we talk about the sudanese crisis the main issue that we've had to you know that we need still to overcome in order to even get anywhere in terms of the basics of 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 providing humanitarian aid or whatever is trying to overcome people's um implicit bias right yeah that, like isn't this always happening to you like how many times do we have to save you or help you because mm-hmm. this has been happening to you right yeah and i think and which I brings think, me to the yeah no i think even just genuinely in i i think the way you put it that it came from a genuine place i think that's 
entirely true. And I think, you know, I mean, in the chat right now, Hollow Rage put it really well, is that even less than the, even more so adding on to it, they look like us. It's, oh, this doesn't happen to people who look like this. Like you could mm -hmm. be black and in the U.S., African-American and think, wait, they they do that over there? I thought mm -hmm. it, it's and it, it's all internalized. It's all internalized where it, Absolutely. it, it was a Absolutely. genuine, you know, when you see things like this, I think genuinely it comes off as a shock. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. precisely that. And again, this is something I've, I've seen you talk about um, in a few different places across a few different videos. But yeah, I think that's that's a big thing is just like you say is. You know, the way you put it, we're wait isn't this just what happens over there mm -hmm. B big big and scare quotes so, over, over there but you know what i mean yeah. right it's so it's like i'm you know we already knew this as people mm -hmm. from the global south as africans we we already knew how people perceive uh conflict or unrest or crisis in our in our countries right but it's been really fascinating to watch it play out on the internet um because people don't realize how offensive uh what they're saying is and how much they've bought into that idea mm -hmm. uh you know but when you read their comments they're like how could you how could you say this the idea that like yeah. this is an internal issue in sudan right that was one of the things that um people said to justify not caring or not tapping in well that's an internal issue so it's not the same as palestine for example because there are two different people fighting each other yes <laughs> but you aren't you're all, all the just, same aren't y'all just right. african <laughs> aren't <y 'all>, yeah <laughs> right <laughs> isn't this so just some why, tribe, like know. isn't just some tribe stuff that like aren't y'all like, always be like an ethnic tribes conflict. Fighting? yeah yeah like tribes fighting mm -hmm. against each other y'all just do that so you could just stop right because you, you look the same right, right right what does that have to do with me all over the way over here yeah but then again you know it, it's it's so interesting to see people see the connections uh in other conflicts Mm -hmm. See how their countries or their communities play a role in what's happening abroad. But when it comes to Africa, no, we're not involved in that. How could we be involved in that? It's so far away. And you guys are always fighting. Yeah. So, yeah, to go back to your original question, though, I just, you know, I don't want this to be, um, I don't want it to be just like us blaming the international community or, you know, it's, it is anti-Black racism. It is, uh, you know, implicit bias about Africa and African conflict. It's all of that. Mm. But it is also partially, you know, like like a lot of Sudanese people have been saying, this is first and foremost, a war against the Sudanese people. It is a war between two generals, two militaries, but it is a war against the Sudanese people. And it it's a war against the Sudanese people because it, you know, our government is preventing the little aid that is coming in from reaching affected communities, mm -hmm. right? There have been a lot of impediments, a lot of um, obstacles that humanitarian organizations have faced, including not allowing their staff to come into the country, not granting them visas, you know, putting a lot of restrictions on their movement and on the movement of um humanitarian aid but also uh not being open to providing safe passages or having even temporary ceasefires to allow for the humanitarian aid to reach these affected places particularly the conflict zones but just all over right because yeah. this war is affecting everybody um our government does not like us our military does not like us when the RSF attacked Medini, SAF left. They took their stuff and they left. And the only people who were left to protect Medini were civilian recruits who are not equipped to be in a war with a seasoned militia. 
It's SAF so, here being the <coughs> actual army. The Sunni's armed forces. Right. The actual the official, official national military. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The left. army dips. They dipped. Which is they dipped. Why? Like I don't want to make light yeah. of this. That's wild. It's wild. Different. No, it's wild. It's, it's a wild. weird it's sentence to say. Wild. Yeah. 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 You I, know, one of the the hard things to have to explain, um, <coughs> excuse me, about this war is the fact that <coughs> we're in the Sunni people are caught between a rock and a hard place. The rock is the Sunni's military, and the hard place is the RSF. We are not finding protection from either side. Yeah. <coughs> and 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 I'll even just very very briefly even summarize what you said. You know the RSF and you know and then the official army, right? These are two. Essentially, you have two really armies, right? You have two really military organizations and this is not a situation of you know you've got this small renegade outfit that is you know running around and you know trying to do things here and there and this bigger more powerful army these are two heavily well-equipped organizations that both in terms of <clears throat> equipment and tactics know what they are doing um but Heavily armed, heavily funded. Yeah. Externally funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, frankly, if <laughs> if you want, and this is kind of up to you, um, we can get into the geopolitics of it. We can get into you know, there, there's some questions. You know, who, who's who's funding? Why? Uh, who's involved? Who stands to gain from these sorts of things? Um, <clears throat> I want to do something a little i mean th this is why it gets a little <coughs> bleak right is is a few people in in chat have mentioned uh you know oh well there isn't you know people don't really care unless there's something to be gained you know something to be gained from them right and one of the wildest headlines i've seen but i'm not mad at it is is this one right here so this is reuters so reuters being you know about as even keeled uh usually as as we've got in the english language uh this joint right here sudan conflict threatens supply of key soft drink ingredient gum arabic <laughs> i think that you, you was mean, the exact yeah. headline i was going to quote really that was the headline that made it to American news outlets, by the way. Incre so, by the way, for, for those, those of y'all who were watching when, when I was doing this on Vice, you remember we talked about Sudan about around this time, and this was one of the articles that we okay. joked about. Uh, we joked about this. It wasn't this exact article, but this is one of the things we were joking about. And we've joked about this, joked in kind of a bleak, cynical way, um, in other in other ways. But, I mean, let's, let's just take a... Just, let me just read you the opening couple lines here to show you where this enters the consciousness for genuinely a lot of people, right? And people, are, again, are being genuine here. All right, so this is from April 28th. April 28th. We're in December. We're about to close out 2023 right now. April 28th. Sudan's eruption of conflict has left international consumer goods makers racing, racing to shore up supplies of gum arabic one of the country's most sought after products and a key ingredient in everything from fizzy drinks to candy and cosmetics about 70 percent of the world's supply of gum arabic for which there are few substitutes comes from the acacia trees in the Sahel region that runs through africa's third largest country which is being torn apart by fighting between the army and a paramilitary force last paragraph that I'll read here. Wary of Sudan's persistent insecurity, companies dependent on the products such as Coca-Cola and PepsiCo have long stockpiled supplies, some keeping between three to six months worth to avoid being caught short, experts, exporters and industry sources told Reuters. 
And then it goes on to say that, well, prior conference, prior conflicts tended to be focused in areas such as Darfur, but this time the capital has brought been brought to a standstill, and it's getting worse. So they're talking about this from a strictly, strictly business perspective, and then this is this is where it enters the conversation. And there are other places where Sudan should enter the conversation in terms of economics. We don't have to get into all of that, but. No joke, and I remember we we kind of cynically joked about this months and months ago, but it sometimes it feels like you got to write a headline like, "Hey man, you might not have Pepsi if you don't mm-hmm. do something." Like you might not get your diet. Like, do you like Diet Coke? Stand right. up for Sudan. It's right. bleak, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, how was this conversation been playing out amongst people you know? You know, um, funnily enough, this is what many Sudanese people sarcastically went to first. Really? Because we knew that people didn't care about whether we lived or died. And so what do they care about? Well, you care about, you know, your pot, your soda. So, hey, in case you don't care that people are dying, your soda supplies are in, you know, in danger. And and it worked. That's why that headline exists. That's why that headline made it to NBC or whatever American um, uh, <clears throat> outlet it was. I think it was NBC because, because Coke was in danger because Pepsi was in danger. Not because people were being slaughtered, but, you know, because... Sudan produces out of that 70% um, of gum Arabic that comes out of the Sahel, 80% of it is from Sudan. So, you know, bleak, bleak is definitely the word. Bleak is definitely the word. I mean, it's, it's bleak, not only because <coughs> of, of that, but, but another bleak part of it is it's hard to necessarily get mad at the person who wrote the headline because it could very well be that the person who wrote the headline knows, yo, this is how I'm going to get people to pay attention to this. I don't know this reporter, but I could definitely see myself. I mean, honestly, maybe that's what I should title this episode is like, Hey, do you like Coca-Cola? Do you like soda? Do you like Coke? (laughs) Do do you like soda? Here's the war that could stop you from having soda. If something isn't done like that, that is, Genuinely, I feel like if you like soda, watch this video. Yeah, if you like soda, watch this video. It genuinely feels like, yeah, like there's a subversion for a good cause. Like you have to Mm -hmm. capture attention by any means necessary. And and this is one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh we've We've had to be very creative with how we present this conflict. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) a lot of times it's at the expense of our humanity. And that's really hard to do. It's very hard to say, care about me because I'm the person who provides this for you. It's been very difficult to see, but it works. Like you said, it works. So, you know, I, I, I'm still on the fence. I'm still sort of like between whatever works and also, God, why is it, this is the only way that it, that it works? Why is this the only way that we show that we're human? And the same way that I really hate comparing or trying to link Sudan's conflict to, um, I won't even say the, I won't even say the Palestinian conflict, I'll say the trend. Mm. Because this is the, the new and hot thing right now, right? I hate linking the two because I'm feeding into the trend as opposed to honoring the humanity of Palestinians and the humanity of Sudanese. Yeah. 
the linking of different things, even though they are linked, you know, and, and, and should be linked, really, I think, is something that I think a lot of people struggle with. I mean, I've seen... I've seen, say, for example, um, Malcolm X's name used a lot um, because he actually did have things to say about Palestine. I've seen Martin Luther King's name used, who who had less to say, um, but much less, actually, but publicly anyway. But I think it's and then comparing to different conflicts globally. um, And I talk with a colleague about this too recently i'm always thinking about this is that part of it one of the things that she said was that the reason reporters i think or journalists do this i think the the good way to take this is that it's attempting to shake you out of your just day-to-day kind of zombie mode and get you to imagine a lot of what we do and I think a lot of what, what you're doing as well is trying to get somebody to imagine, okay, if this doesn't feel relevant to you, imagine if you were there. Maybe that will make some of this sink in, you know, the, for the same reason that we say numbers and we say, and we, you know, emphasize numbers sometimes when we have to is okay. Let that sink in a little bit more. Um, but yeah, the, the desire to compare, I understand it, and I think it's valid, but it also sometimes, for some people, it feels like it it, it takes away or it's offensive. And, mm-hmm. you know, I try to be patient with that too. But at the same time, I also feel like these are not different solar systems that we're talking about here. I mean, these, are, these places are actually quite close, but also yeah. <clears throat> they're genuinely, but all these places are genuinely connected. It's not like somebody stays inside their little border and then never leaves. Right. Some do, lots don't. Well, I mean, that's the thing, right? The reality is these conflicts are linked. Mm-hmm. These struggles are absolutely linked. There are, you know, um, overarching powers that have their hands in both there the the there are similarities in the form of oppression and the weapons used these oppressive um powers oppressive forces trade secrets they trade weapons they trade uh tactics they trade information on how to subjugate their their people or the people within their borders but the problem is is that within the context of social media mm-hmm. right which is what we're relying on now to to get to ironically to get political change movement mm-hmm. some sort of action is that it's it's very reductionist yeah like when when we talk about sudan Right, even in the comments of that video, that overview video, everybody wanted to know how Israel is involved. I just know it. I just know Israel is involved. Uh, sure, yes, but also, this is not about Israel. Mm-hmm. Yes, Israel is involved. Yes, uh, the RSF uses weapons from Israel. My Israel, the Israeli government has a relationship with the RSF. The Israeli government has a relationship with SAF. But this is not about them. But everybody wants to know where the direct connection is. Right? Mm-hmm. And that is just reduces it to folks want to understand this conflict within their very narrow frame of reference. Yeah without being open to understanding the similarities, but also the unique context of this particular conflict. I think it also, it, it risks, oh, yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that that's the struggle that I personally have been facing and trying to mm. explain this is that inevitably the comments are always going to come back to, but bring it to where I think it should be. Yes. Yeah. 
and and that's that's hard to it's hard to get people out of that mindset and this is this would be the double edged sword of the comparison is because by comparing you 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 link things which are linked right listen if if it makes it easier for somebody if it makes you know th- this group I'm not talking to y'all because y'all y'all know you're already on the same page with us. But you know, for some people, if I need to make their if I need to explain it to a little bit, if I need to explain this to them a bit better, I could say or more bring them in a bit more. I could say, hey, uh, you mm-hmm. ever heard of Wagner? You know them dudes out there, you know, right. causing some havoc over in Ukraine. You know, you know they're kind of involved too. Do you know that? Oh, okay, my your ears per- perk up, right? And we. UAE, we could bring in all bunch of players, you know, shadowy and not. We could do all that. We could bring in the United States. We can bring in basically whoever you want. And yes, that is true. I worry that it it does a couple things. One, it risks turning this into a kind of weird political chess game. You start thinking about it as chess. Ah, I see. This guy and this guy and this guy are doing this. And okay, I understand now. Cool. And and you, it feels like you just solved the Rubik's cube, and you can put the Rubik's cube down on the table and walk away. Is it? Hey, right. remember the part that we said about five million people are hungry? Remember that part? Like you solved the Rubik's cube, they're still hungry. Like I, I'm, I'm happy right. for you. I'm very happy <laughs> that you now understand it. Yeah. Like you get a hundred, a hundred out of a hundred on your, you know, international relations test. They're still hungry. I'm and, so glad I agreed to come on this uh, with you and to talk to you because you are what you're saying right now is a is a bomb on my soul. It's a salve right now because at some point you feel like you're crazy. You feel like you've lost your mind because. There is such satisfaction for people in knowing, like you said, in solving the Rubik's Cube, Mm. in figuring it out. I'm smart. I see the connections. I got my third eye open. Mm. But we're still hungry and dying. And like I'm talking to you about all these other things that I really need your support on, these other aspects that I would really like your attention on, but you have stopped paying attention because you've reached the point that you of, of satisfaction for you whatever mm-hmm. curiosity you had in your mind has been satisfied right and that's it and then you can go off and, and say to yourself that i participated i'm aware i'm up on current events but mm-hmm. yes this is a current event but it is also a lived reality yeah and that's the part that we're missing. Yeah. Shout out to Yusra for <laughs> convincing you to come. Listen, through. shout out to Yusra <laughs> for setting this up because I didn't know how much I needed this. I, I won't lie. I was like, I'm sick. You know, I'm nervous. I'm a little tired, but I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I'm so oh. glad I'm here. I'm very glad you're here. I'm very glad you're here. I got, I got to send you the picture we have of us like in London looking like we're about to drop a mixtape or something. It was <laughs> incredible. She was she, she's super kind to of me. But no, I I think that's so much of it, though, is is just feeling like, yeah, OK, I get it. I get it. Um, as you've mentioned, and it has been very well established, um, sexual violence is being used as a tool here. Um, and you know, I think there we we could go on and on about the horrors that we're seeing. We could go on that that people are seeing, that people are living through. Again, the UN has been called this a crisis. Has been said. I mean, yeah, this they, is, they said it's the the worst humanitarian disaster. Yeah. Currently in the world. Which says a lot. Which says a lot. If they say it's yeah. the worst humanitarian, like, we don't need to compare things, but. Let's think about what a lot of people are focusing on or a lot of people are aware of if they are aware of it. And the UN has said, this is the worst. That's, again, numbers Speak. cease to mean anything at a certain point. I mean, what what's the difference between 1 million and 5 million? Can you count that high? I can't. 
the Muslim media, they, they, they cease, it ceases to become people, yeah. I think. Um, mm -hmm. I want to address something which I've seen you address with great patience. <laughs> um, but I want to read a, a comment. Um, you were trying to explain why people aren't seeing these viral videos like they're seeing in other places. And, and I think it is an important thing to understand. And there was a particular person who commented who said, hey, well, why aren't we getting live video? Why aren't we getting, where's the video of this? How do we know it's happening? I'm going to read this. I want to see live video, and then they say, live video, media footage from people who are currently there showing what's happening in the present moment, not past recordings. These individuals can stream live about what is currently going on. The only way to verify that because something is actually currently happening is to see it live. So this is... And I want I want to be very I, I see you laughing you probably remember this one because this this was a heavy one right I do yeah I do. I I, I want to be really on your behalf because I don't think you should be I want to be very <laughs> diplomatic and generous to this person but I wonder if you could tell me um you could give your explanation of okay hold on if this stuff is so bad I've seen stuff from. Shoot, I've seen stuff from front lines of Ukraine. I've seen stuff out of Palestine. These <clears throat> images are horrible. Why am I not They're seeing terrible. anything out of there? Why Why am I not seeing what's happening in Sudan? First, I want to dispel a myth hmm. that nothing is coming out of Sudan. That is untrue. Yes, that's a good one. Yeah, please. Things are coming out of Sudan. Uh, lots of videos are coming out of Sudan. Mm -hmm. filmed by the same people who are committing the atrocities. Yeah. They are TikToking it like gangbusters. They're really having a great time documenting their uh, uh, campaign of terror. Mm -hmm. That has happened. And it's been happening uh, since day one. In fact, that those are the videos that Sudanese people share to show what's happening to each other mm -hmm. before the world taps in. But the reason why civilians are not, um, I won't say are not, cannot. The reason why civilians cannot do the same And if I could even, is if, that, I could, if I can pause for yeah. just a second, just, just to, when you, I want to, I'm not going to show them, but I'll, I'll describe a few of these. I mean, these are videos of people. When you say that, you know, this very same people who are committing the atrocities are putting the videos out, right? We're talking about, you know, people burning a town to the ground. The flames are still going and they're videoing the flame and celebrating and then playing music. Mm -hmm. Or there's a truly, truly heinous one. <clears throat> which I'm not going to show because I don't even think I could show that on Twitch. I think I might genuinely get this account taken down, but there's a person who is lying on the ground and it looks like a mummy or something like that. And then they move, it moves a little bit and you realize, Oh no, this is a person who has been wrapped up in Saran wrap so tightly that they cannot move. They can breathe and they can kind of wiggle their fingers and that's it. Just imagine this. Um, Maybe, frankly, imagining it's probably worse than, than showing it to you, but it's yeah, there's a person lying on the ground. They're wrapped up in saran wrap. It looks like a coffin, and they're yeah. essentially saying, this is somebody who we've kidnapped, and this is going to speak to what, what you're talking about. They're going through their phone. They're, they're going to find every person who this person is connected to, every person who this person is connected to, and demand money. Or worse. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that threat is also that we're going to, this was in Medani, we're going to take them back to Khartoum and we're going to, we're going to do what we want with them. We're going to torture them there if you don't give us money or if, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> the RSF is really having, like I said, a great time sharing 
um, what they're doing to people with complete impunity. Um, so in that sense, the videos are there, the evidence is there, mm -hmm. but the reason why civilians can't show you what's happening to them is because let's start with the, with the, um, with the logistical issues, you know, you, you, you have very shoddy internet. There are no telecommunications. Uh, in many places, it's completely cut off. They're, they're under a complete telecom blackout. In other places, you have to really try very hard to get access to a network. And also, we forget that Sudan, you know, the Sudanese government over the last 30 years has uh, prioritized the capital at the expense of the rest of the country. So the kind of infrastructure that is available to folks in the capital, we can't say the same for other places, particularly right. small villages. You know, maybe the cities are, are a little better, but small villages and rural areas across Sudan have been cut off. You know, that's just how they've always lived. It, it, you know, underserved uh, with very little infrastructure. So that was an issue that's already there, and now in this war has become an even bigger disadvantage to people because now they're forced to stay in these rural areas that are already cut off from the world. Yeah. Uh, so you know, in that sense, there's that issue, um, but also the the deliberate uh, cutting of phone lines, the deliberate destruction of of um, you know telecom towers and whatever to make it so that people cannot communicate. That's just on the logistical side, yeah. on the you know. But there's also the very real risk of being <clears throat> killed for recording. Any any videos that you see from civilians are videos that they've recorded hiding behind a wall or in their homes, um, trying to get you know footage of what's happening. But you're worried for your life, and a lot of people have made this point. <coughs> that even I didn't consider, which is that, you know, people are, again, are making the comparison. Well, <coughs> Palestinians are living through this horrendous situation. You know, they're being bombed constantly, but they're still bringing footage. We still see footage from the wreckage. We still footage of, see footage of what they're ha what's happening to them. Why isn't the same coming out of Sudan? And the difference is, is that in Sudan, it's a face-to-face -face danger. You are coming face to face with the, with these people. Besides the fact that they take your phone, they search your phone, and if you have anything related to the war on it, or even you mention it just, you know, tangentially. Even if you're just saying I am escaping, you're not talking about what they're doing. You're talking about what you're doing or what your family is doing. That's that's seen as as a threat. But also, you're face to face with your attacker. Mm -hmm. You cannot hold up a phone and say, I'm gonna record you searching my phone or I'm gonna record you coming on this bus and and you know and terrorizing people and shooting into the bus because you you'll be shot. That's it. Yeah. And, and and that's what people are not understanding. The the, the the risk is not just exposure. It's not just that you are, you know, um it, you're not it's not, it's not just that you are a person who shows what's happening and therefore you have a target on your back. You have a target on your back regardless. Just by being a civilian, you have a target on your back. <clears throat> and how do you show the world that? Yeah. When, you know, you can't, you know, that puts you at risk, but also your phone is taken from jump. Your phone is taken before you can even pull it out to record. Right. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there's, again, <coughs> comparison Comparison is, is going to be difficult no matter what, but, you know, there's there's a difference between being able to walk around, you know, searching for people that, you know, oh my gosh, did a neighborhood over there, <coughs> it looks like they got bombed, let's run over there and see what happened. The, this is happening face-to-face, -face, person to person. This isn't long distance. And people are still distance. doing that, right? Yeah. People are still doing that despite the risk. People are, that's that's one of the things that, you know, really that's pro probably the most upsetting thing to me is the fact that people are still doing that despite the very real risk. People mm -hmm. are still um, you know, 
facing that risk and in order to to show what's happening like people are still taking video and pictures of of their of you know their neighborhoods that are bombed Mm -hmm. of the things that they that they're doing in order to survive like the soup kitchens that they've set up you know in, in areas that are under siege by the rsf um those pictures are coming out those videos are coming out but the real question becomes why do you need to see people at their very worst yeah. in order to believe that they that they deserve help? Why do we need to see the, the videos of, you know, uh, of parents holding their dead children for us to be like, oh, no, this is a terrible situation? Why is that the point where you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to take a stand now? Yeah. You know, it's it's we're just so used to trauma porn we're so used to seeing people suffering that to me i think it doesn't serve as much as it um exploits the exploitation outweighs the service yeah you know um there's there's a video also that you posted. I want to play this because this is this is a video that you play. Now you're not you're not gonna see any disturbing imagery, just so you know, except for somebody describing something. Okay, but but I'm a I'm a I'm a switch us over real quick. Before you play it, I just want to say that yeah, I make it a point not to share um, graphic images out mm-hmm. of Sudan because I don't want to feed into that, and I think. You know, these videos that the RSF makes, it, these are the videos that are truly heinous and that truly show the reality of the violence and depravity that's happening. And these videos are made specifically to demean the people that they are inflicting that depravity on. Yeah. By me sharing it, I am adding to that. I am participating in it. And that's why I don't. And I think that's why a lot of people, um, non-Sudanese people who are following my page are disappointed when I don't show that kind of content because that's what they want to see. But I'm not going to participate in the further dehumanization of my people. Like that's just not a thing that I'm ready to do. And, you know, if they're not okay with it and the, the content is boring because it's just me explaining it to you, I'm okay with that. The content is boring. I'm so I just had to say that back to you. This is not. This is not offense to you. This is not offense. That's what it is. This is. This is what. This is how. This is, is what that we what do. It is. is the is my content mm-hmm. boring? I'm sorry. People who who comment a lot of the comments are thank you for your content, and I'm like this. This isn't content. This isn't content. <laughs> content. No. <laughs> thank you for your content. Not the content. Thank you for your educational content. It's not content. It's. This is my life. <laughs> this is this, these are our lives. I now need a break, and so I'm going to play this. Uh, but let, let's let's watch this. So this is for those for those who are uh, you know got this playing in the background. You can be hearing a language that is not English, um, but there's some subtitles here if you want to read along. So here we go. <laughs> جدي إبراهيم مرسال معروفة عند البعض برقمات شباب الحلة ما في شاب طلع تخيلوا بيمنا عشرة عشرة في المية عشرة في المية خمسة مجروحين وخمسة الباقي سالمين تسعين في المية كلها استشهدت في مدينة الجنينة منطقة قلدمتا الشغلة دي انتو بيتو الدعفور للجنجويت وقلتو ما تخلوا فيه ولا زول ذات بشر السمراء 
بيجيبوا يقتلوا لا برحم وتفل لا برحم وزول كبير لا برحم ومرع انا انا بتكلم هزي انا اسرتي كلها استشهدت اسرتي كلها ماتت كلها ماتت في عرض مرتها كلها استشهدت ابوي اخواني الاولاد اولاد خيلاني امامي اماتي اخواني الصغار كلهم استشهدوا والله يشيل حق الله يجيب حقه منك انت همتي ومنك يا برهان ونحن بنقول لكم والله كل ما سلينا كل ما سلينا اي مواطن قاعد في في اردمتها اه انتوا احوا احل برا كما ادت الاخوان كل ما تقولوا قتلوا لنا ما في ولا زول والله ينتظم منك والله ينتظم من ناسك البيوتل من غير رحمه البيوتل من غير رحمه بحرقوا الكبار السن الشفه برموا في النار حرقوا البيوت قتلوا الناس ب فأبشى ما تتخيل دخلوا عرض متى ما خلوا منه شاب طلع الله ينتظم منك الله ين... نحن كل ما سلينا بنت إليكم الله ينتظم منك وكلكم جماعة أي زول عنده أحل في دارفور حد دارفور دي كلها أبو أولاد جنجويت جست throwing kids into a fire I'm sure there's video of this. We're not going to show it. But the question, be, and by, by the way, one, one other thing that should be mentioned is, again, why videos, in, in terms of videos not, not coming out from, from civilians, from people who are, are being affected by this, um, you know, engineers, telecom workers are doing, are doing their best to bring communications back up at great personal risk not because a bomb might fall from somewhere and not because you know the health hazards and things like that but because they will be targeted that they, that there is genuine fear and genuine credible fear that if you're caught working on something trying to fix something so that people can communicate with people whether it's in the next town or overseas that somebody with a gun will come to you close to you and harm you or a sniper yeah because that's yeah that's also a possibility that the, a sniper will fight you and pick you off because you are trying to fix telecom lines or trying to pick fix fat, uh, water lines or what whatever it may be trying to offer a service that alleviates some of the suffering of the people yeah so, you know, and I think that's one of the most difficult things here is that there is, and, and th this commenter, this person who was commenting, I think they were just bold enough to say what a lot of people are thinking, frankly. Um, I'm not going to speculate about where they're from. I have my suspicions. Um, but there is a, there is this. I'm just going to use the word. It's this bizarre entitlement that mm. a lot of us feel. And I'm just going to say, you know, Global North, particularly Americans, um, genuinely feel like we are owed trauma porn. Let's call it that. And if you don't give it to us, then I won't give you something. What, what is something? Usually it's maybe a like. You know, heart heart your TikTok or whatever. You know, I'm like I, you know, I, again, I feel like I'm making these really cynical jokes, but but that seems to genuinely be be what's happening. Is there? I feel like there is a genuine place, which is, hey, I'm a discerning, concerned viewer of the news, and I want to stay informed, and so I want to be able to verify and do my own research. Yes, that's great. There's also a way in which some people turn that into show me all the gore, show me all the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm owed that. And then maybe one of those videos might shake me out of my trance th that I'm somehow enjoying this stuff and make me want to do something. I don't know what that something is, but maybe, but you have to prove to me that you are worth it. And it's, it's mm -hmm. this really insidious yeah. trap that it puts people into. My attention is currency. Prove to me that dance monkey. <laughs> Prove to me that you are worth my attention. Um, I, I think as an American, I can confidently say, 
we have that. Mm -hmm. That that whole like the U.S. We are the most influential country in the world, and therefore our attention is the most important in the world. Mm -hmm. So prove to me that you are worth my attention, because me as an American citizen, I have a lot of power, and if I don't see what I like, then you know. But that's not the. I think the the West has this idea, mm -hmm. and the Arab world has a similar but different idea, mm -hmm. and that is um, that that comes from the stereotype that Sudanese we as Sudanese people we straddle we straddle Africa and the Middle East, right? Mm -hmm. We are fully on the African continent. But culturally, uh, we have been pushed towards the Arab world, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I say pushed because <clears throat> various governments have made it a point to prioritize the Arab identity over the African one. Mm -hmm. And that's why today we, you know, for a lot of our African siblings, we're not there's a there's a contentious relationship there. There's a tense relationship there. Because our government has always valued the Arab identity, we changed the flag to be more like uh, other Arab countries. If you see our flag, you'll see a similarity with flags across the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so we've always tried to, um, you know, uh, to sort of uh, play up our proximity, <coughs> our proximity to Arabness. Unfortunately, um, the Arab world sees Sudanese people as, actually, before I get into that, Sudanese people, um, you know, Sudan had a favorable position for uh, many Arabs, particularly Arabs of the Gulf. They've, you know, historically, they've come to study in Sudan. University of Khartoum was an internationally accredited university. So they would come study there before their countries hit oil and, and you know, skyrocketed in their development. Sudanese people have a lot to do with that development. We went to these Gulf countries. Uh, we were teachers. <coughs> we were educators. We were doctors. But we were also um, employees in their governmental institutions. We helped set up a lot of those institutions. And so... Um, Somewhere along the line, I think that became threatening to people. Mm -hmm. And then we started to see, you know, you'll see like the difference in generations. My father's generation, for example, Arabs of my father's generation will recognize Sudanese people's accomplishments in the Arab world. <coughs> they know, <clears throat> they know they'll know and always talk about, oh, my teacher was Sudanese, my colleague was Sudanese, mm -hmm. whatever, my professor, I, I studied in Sudan, um, you know, <clears throat> they'll recognize that, that connection. But uh, younger generations will talk about Sudanese people's laziness instead. Mm -hmm. uh, Sudanese people are lazy. Sudanese people love beds. They have beds in their homes, which is true. Our homes, because we have the sense of community, you know, our living room is not a, a, a few couches, maybe now, it's a, a cou couches and some chairs and stuff. Mm. But the traditional Sudanese living room is beds because you are always accommodating people. People are always coming in and staying with you. Mm. You need the bed space. That's part of this sense of community. Right, right. That translates over there into Sudanese people are lazy. So they even have beds in their living room. Ha! <laughs> Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. I see. I see. Um, yeah. Uh, Anti-blackness is, is prevalent in the Arab world. And so there are all of these stereotypes. And so in this war, we are seeing um, the Arab world, even though Arab media really has been the first to cover what's happened in Sudan. Um, but Arab people who are just now getting hip to what's happening, are uh, tr um, interpret their lateness into Sudanese people are not doing enough to show what's happening to them. That's why I didn't hear about it. Right. 
because you're not making an effort. So these people are so lazy, they can't even talk about their own war, right? There's that, maybe it, sometimes it's that bold hmm. and sometimes not so much. Sometimes it comes from a good place. Right. right. But like I said, like this good place that is heavily tainted by implicit bias, you're assuming you don't know because nobody's been talking about it. You don't. But it really it's because you are not interested in knowing because we're not a priority to you. We're not the part of the world that you look to. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I, I, I say all that to say that, like. We are, you know, we are at the same time suffer from um, racism and anti-blackness from the West and racism and anti-blackness from the, the East, I'll say the East. Right. And um, those manifest in, in different ways, but the effect is still the same, which is to dismiss and overlook and blame us for our own suffering. And then you come in and and you're making these videos, you're making these posts, right? Giving people, truly giving people the benefit of the doubt. Saying, hey, if you didn't watch my video on day 198, maybe you watch it on day 199. If you didn't watch that, maybe you read my, you know, 150 character tweet from day 250 and then you do it again right and and i know for mm -hmm. some some of your audience of course is sudanese but but a lot of it is is not um and i mean i've seen you also say i i there was a somebody asked you made a video and then under one of the comments somebody said hey wait where's the rest of the information and you commented back something like well hey i'm trying to is verbatim. I'm trying to ensure people have the attention span to get all of the information because many people have expressed that they don't watch long videos. That's have people legitimately told you, hey, your videos are too long? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Your videos are too long. But but maybe not your videos are too long like that. But certainly, hey, I have a tip for you. Maybe next time make the video shorter or make it in two parts so that more people will watch. Or, hey, how about you summarize what's happening in the video in the first 15 seconds so that people know what they're getting into before they watch the whole, so they don't have to watch the whole video or so that you can grab their attention yeah. so they'll stay for the whole video. Which is, these are all legitimate tips. These are good tips. These are true. Yeah. The, Great these tips. These are right. These are correct. For content. Yeah. For content. Yes. But if you're here and you're not willing to sit for three minutes or five minutes, I'm not even asking you to sit. I'm not asking you to look at my face. You can listen as you do your life stuff. You can wash your dishes or cook your dinner and play the video in the background. You don't have to look at me. But if you're not willing to sit for five minutes to absorb this information that is just the tip of the iceberg five minutes is not even enough for me to really talk about that topic um fully to give you a full picture then what do i need with your attention it's you know it's again it's it's the issue of of seeing it as content and not a live reality can i ask you uh personal question that I've gotten asked by about five different people in in my Instagram comments because mm -hmm. you saw that I posted the hey if anybody's got questions please ask mm -hmm. I'm gonna summarize actually I'm looking at this honestly about six or seven different com uh six or seven different uh questions into one um and this is from uh Tulos, man, I, I'm, I think they encapsulated the best. Um, you mentioned that you aren't a journalist. Calling back to actually the question mm -hmm. I said at the beginning. Um, they say, you mentioned that you aren't a journalist. What drives you to be so active? Much love. The survival of my family. Hmm. Um, this is something that Sudanese people have been saying. Uh, I've had to be an activist. 
this has forced me to become an activist. This has forced me to become a journalist because the journalists are not doing it. I, I say in the beginning of this stream, I said that this is not a job for me. And it's not. The difference between journalists and me is journalists cover other things. <clears throat> Today, journalists will write about Sudan. Tomorrow, they'll write about the Congo. The next day, they'll write about Syria. The next day, they'll write about, you know, South America. Um, I'm, I'm talking about Sudan because it serves me personally. Mm -hmm. I can't be a journalist. Because a journalist, I would be the worst kind. <laughs> a journalist that only knows about one place, that's the worst kind. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of those. You ever you ever met anybody in yeah. D.C.? You, you, there's a you lot take of them, them. You take them like three miles away from the hill, and they're lost. Like physically, they don't know and where listen, they are anymore. No and shade, but shade. No shade, but shade. Like if you are a journalist that only knows about your little corner of the whatever – you're not really a journalist to me. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. And you know, that's I'm 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 upset. I ups, I get upset at the when people not upset. That's that's an overstatement. Hmm. But I get annoyed when people call me a journalist because I know actual journalists. <laughs> I am friends with actual journalists, and that's a disservice to them, to their craft, their profession, and the amount of time that they've put into becoming who they are in their profession, when somebody just watches my videos or reads a recap of what happened today and they call me a journalist, that's wild to me. That's wild to me. And again, that's the effect of social media. Anybody who grabs a mic and talks in a, in a calm voice and does the hands gestures and as the little things on the end, edge of the screen that's a journalist to you i feel like you know man, you have more respect for journalists than i do yo <laughs> i feel like <laughs> they're not yo, making it I, easy no, but yeah no i know enough good journalists to keep you know to keep um to keep that respect and i also keep that respect because I come from a country where there is no freedom of speech mm. and journalists have risked their lives to talk about the issues that are happening in Sudan. Um, they've had their uh, newspapers shut down. They've been arrested. They've been exiled. I know what journalism, I know the power of journalism and I know what journalists go through in order to, true journalists go through in order to report the truth. So I would never claim to be a journalist, just like I would never claim to be an activist. An activist to me is somebody, again, who stands up for, uh, who puts their, themselves on the line for the issues, for issues and causes that deserve it, mm -hmm. not just one. I am just talking about Sudan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that I don't support other causes. <clears throat> <laughs> but I am doing this for myself and my people first and foremost <clears throat> before I do it for anybody else. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I'm a <laughs> I feel like I'm hitting your limit here. Thank you so much. For real, for real. Everybody in chat, please, please continue to thank Sarah for, for you know, just you know, push pushing through this. Truly, truly appreciate it. Um another series of questions that I've gotten that I'll kind of summarize here, um, which is that I'll put it this way, I guess there's a sort of, and I want to use this word neutrally, but a sort of public posturing that we see a lot. Right. Um, you know, when war in Ukraine broke out, it, became the right thing to do. I don't want to say fashionable, but you dig what I'm saying. It became the thing to do to post that flag. You know what I mean? You you couldn't even find Ukraine on a map last week. But get that blue and yellow up there, right? Um, October 7th happens. 
And it became whichever way you swing, say something. And if you didn't say something, it was a problem. And this brings me back to, I think, there's a recurring uh, a recurring theme or recurring thing that I touch on is the black squares in the summer of 2020. Post that black square. If you or your company or your organization or, you know, the burger joint down the road has not posted their black square, what are y'all doing? Right. Um, I do see some value in that. I also, again, feel like at, at some times it is just like you said, sometimes it feels like. Well, I'm giving you attention and my attention is valuable. And what, what more do you want? Right. Um, that's a big wind up to ask you. For a lot of people, this conversation may be the first they've heard about it. Um, what would you like to see people do? Engage genuinely. Not because you feel like you have to, not because it's a trendy thing to do, not because you're being uh, guilted by the videos that you come across of people being like, if you don't talk about this thing, then what are you doing with your life? Oh, I would never talk to anybody who's not talking about this thing. Engage because you truly want to understand um because only through that will you be compelled to actually do something everything else is just lip service everything else is mm. like you said that black square that black square was a nice gesture but it was not enough and a lot of people stopped there and a lot of people yes you know did the black square because they felt guilty because they saw their friends doing it or they saw, you know, or people talked about it and they just didn't want to be, they didn't want to go through the hassle of being canceled, whatever that means, yeah. you know? They didn't want to go through the hassle of being asked why they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. That kind of action leads very little result, if any. Check the box. And, right. And so, you know, for Sudan, like, there's so much that people need to understand. I said this in, in, I think in one of my videos, that like, I re recognize that a huge part of the problem of why Sudan is not getting the attention or not is not on anybody's radar is that people don't know about us, don't know enough about us as a people in order to care. We have a large Sudanese community here in America you know, particularly in the DMV, we're, we're everywhere, but particularly in the DMV. Mm. But we're invisible. You know, De when Del you think Delaware, of, Maryland, uh, Vermont, not everybody in here is from the state, so not everybody knows <laughs> it. So up up in the little eastern <laughs> section, not quite in New York, yeah. but up in there, yeah. No, yeah, even in, even in the Tri-State area of New York, <clears throat> we're there too, but when you think of African communities in America, you think of the Nigerian community, Ghanaian, you know, but you don't really think about Sudanese. We're not visible. Mm. And that invisibility makes it difficult for people to, to care. It makes sense. You don't have anything to connect it to. Who, who do I know who's Sudanese or where have I seen Sudan? You know, Nigerian and Ghanaian, we have the Jolof Wars. We know like <laughs> what's going on, you know what I'm mean? saying? <laughs> Do not get us straight here. Afro Come beef. on now. <laughs> right. We got Afro beef or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. But Sudan doesn't have that same sort of popular uh, visibility in popular culture. And so people don't really know anything about Sudan. So how can they care about a people that they've never seen? And to me, um, the first step for anybody who really sees themselves as someone who cares about humanity or, you know, who wants to be involved in these sorts of causes is to learn about the people. And um, and also that, need, that 
effort goes beyond what's readily available to you without effort. Um, you know, my videos are not enough for people to understand Sudan and Sudanese people. You gotta, at some point, you gotta go do that on your own. And, 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 and I'm happy to help. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. I share videos on Insta stories all the time for things that, that fall outside of just the war. You know, a lot of art, a lot of music, a lot of whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's an invitation. That's a subtle invitation for you to go dive in some more on that. The more you know about a people, the more connected you feel to them, even if you don't know them personally. Right. And um, yeah, the more you know about them, the more connected you feel, the more compelled you feel to do something. So that's I mean, that's what I would that's what I would advise. Yeah. Um, trends die out and soon the world will move on to something else and TikTok will move on to something else. And that'll be that. Mm -hmm. But can you say that you are for humanity if you're swayed by the algorithm? Can you say that you cared about the cause if you don't remember it, don't look for it the moment the algorithm surprises it or moves on to something else? Um, somebody said, I really appreciate the comments that say, your videos are not coming up for me anymore. I have to come look for your page. Mm. That to me is really somebody who's interested, somebody who really cares, because first of all, you remembered my account. Right. You remember my handle. That's crazy to me, because we somebody I saw a TikTok the other day that was like, you know, I, we don't even remember people's accounts. Like we we just be scrolling, 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 right. one video to the next. You don't. You might have liked the video, but you don't know what that person's account name is. Mm -hmm. You don't know how to come back to their content. Yeah. Um, so if people remember, if, if people go out of their way to check my account, I, I am so grateful for that. I'm so appreciative for that. And that also tells me that that person really is invested versus just like, oh yeah, I can't find any content on Sudan. Like click on the hashtag. Yeah. All you got to just click on the hashtag. Yeah. I think, you know. No, and I, I mean, I, again, I think you, you were doing so much in this. Cause look, I'm gonna say this, man. Um, not everybody has the patience that you do. I feel like I have a decent amount of patience also to explain things to people, um, because I know that not everybody does. And sometimes there will come mm -hmm. a day, or there will come, you know, a month stretch <laughs> where I just run out of patience. And I don't have time yeah. to be answering the same question to everybody over and over and over again about whatever it is they want to know about me or people who look like me or, or people who mm -hmm. don't look like me that I happen to have some kind of a connection to. Right. And I'll just not have the energy to engage. Um, and it's mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you've I mean, as you said, you know, one of the things that, that drives you, obviously, is it it has to do with your family. Right. But even then, that doesn't mean that, you know, one can just continue asking it's just because it can go two different ways right one is just fam google but we also know that not everybody genuinely has the patience to google and it means that, and that is why things like these ridiculous social media strategies that we find ourselves you know being told to use like hey summarize what you're going to say in the first 15 seconds the first three seconds mm -hmm. or you know show a picture first or all the make your videos shorter or whatever but I think also do a dance while you talk about war. <laughs> What'd you say? Do a do a trending do a trending TikTok dance while oh you're talking gosh. about it. Yes, so yeah, that, yeah. So do, it'll do, come up on the algorithm. Yeah, exactly. It, which <laughs> look, some people do that, and I have no, you know, like I remember, the, the, dude, the the argument about. I don't know if you remember those memes about. Uh, it would be something to be somebody cooking, and then all of a sudden it would say, "Also, by the way." Arrest the cops that killed Breonna Taylor. Mm -hmm. Which is just, mm -hmm. I talked to one of my former coworkers uh, about that. Like, what do what do you think the people in that community feel like that? Like, what does the family think about it? And I think it's it's mixed. 
it's mixed because Mm -hmm. on one hand it feels mad disrespectful and on the other hand i got your attention and maybe yeah you were one one in a hundred people who wasn't really thinking about it but it jarred you enough to maybe go do something you know what i mean but yeah. I also think, you know, one of the things that I was in any of my former coworkers, you heard me hear say that you, people would hear me say this all the time. I would say this about almost everywhere. I would say, yo, when's the last time you saw a news story or any mini doc or whatever with somebody speaking in Spanish where they're not talking about getting deported or shot at? Mm. You do what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like when's the and like when's the last time you saw genuinely anything in Africa where it's not somebody getting kicked out, hungry or shot at? And like, yep. Mexicans do some cool shit. I promise you, <laughs> constantly, and that's just what I'm familiar with, right? There's stuff they do I don't even know about. I haven't discovered that yet. But I'll get incredibly frustrated because listen, I know border issues are important. I understand all that. We got to talk about that. But like if every single time you see a brown face, they're crying or they're not alive. Like, come on, man. And like, you you really mean to tell me, you really mean to tell me that there's not one Sudanese person making some cool music, cooking some cool food, doing doing something artistic throwing some paint at a wall doing some kind of art form that i don't even have a word for yet truly you mean that i refuse to believe that and so yeah if my first interaction is i don't know where this is on a map and it looks like they're fighting again okay let me keep scrolling i I genuinely feel like this is uh, this is a larger societal stuff it's it's hard for me to blame any one person you dig but I feel like, yo, if you're not even being exposed to stuff that helps people register, you register as somebody that you'd want to talk to, that maybe you do mm-hmm. talk to, you just don't know anything about them. Maybe you see them at the shop all the time, you just don't know. Then right. how is it a surprise that we wave it off and say, oh, man, they're they doing that thing again. Damn. Yep. Yeah, um, and I think uh, that's also something that we struggle with, or I also I'll speak my, for myself. I struggle with mm. with that because I understand that we need to build our human image in the world. We need to, you know, we need to build that. That's not a thing that is given to us by virtue of being human. We have to show that we are Um, and I understand the value of showing that we are in order to garner attention for what we're going through but there's also you shouldn't have to you should on the flip side what you're saying this is a wild paragraph you just said (laughs) yeah but on the flip side you know to to prove your point that we shouldn't have to is the Sudanese reaction to see seeing content that isn't war related because it's interpreted as you've moved on (laughs) we're dying and you're talking about you're talking about a a song you're talking about a dance man you're talking about somebody painting what are we doing right now right in both ways coming and going and yeah and that's understandable because yeah (laughs) yeah i don't want to talk about you know, that music festival that that Sudanese person uh, uh, performed at. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that. That's stupid to me right now. Personally, personally, it makes me mad, right? Mm-hmm. But I have to show that, show that so people know that we have a life outside of conflict. Because folks look at Africa, think about the Congo. All the images we're seeing from the DRC are just harrowing. Mm-hmm. But those people are not just that, you know, they're not just that oh. crisis. You know what, you know what Congolese people Any... like? They like wrestling. That's the one thing. Right. That's the one thing I did in Congo is I went to Kinshasa and wrestling. It's like, y'all like wrestling? Like Hulk Hogan wrestling? Yes, we do. That's Incredible. Many people love them from wrestling. That I don't and know the music, what it is. Dude, and the music that they play before, I, I had so many people pull me aside and say, bro, come back. And do something on the music because everybody around us like 
You hear about the Afrobeats? No, 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 no. Us. We do it the best. It, it was right. the most incredible thing. I promise you, they bring out the band before the wrestling match. And they, like, That's with amazing. the trumpets and the tubas. And it's like, I, I couldn't imagine this. I never would have known this. How would I know? How would I know this? Genuinely, how would how I How would you? Yeah. How would you? In the same way that, you know, this is... <clears throat> Social media and like, particularly TikTok is a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. It's for all the complaining that I've been doing about it <laughs> over the last two hours. Yeah. That app opens you up to so many things you would never see. Yeah. So many fascinating, just personal stories that you would never yeah. come across. Um, And I don't know how it does it. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if the same way that these really fascinating, very unique, very things that are very different to me that I've never seen before come across other people's timelines, come across other people's for you pages. But if, if, if we leaned into that, there, there would be such a big difference in people's mindsets if they, if they open themselves up to that. If they mm-hmm. leaned into it, they didn't just like scroll past and the algorithm picked up that you're not interested in this. But that's such an incredible tool for um, for just changing people's outlook, exposing them to different things. Like right now, what I'm, what I'm doing on TikTok is just sharing videos from Sudanese creators who are not making this stuff about the war, just... Like there's a there's oh I wish I remembered her account name see I'm telling you we don't remember the account okay. name send, send, send it to me this was gonna be my final question to be is well here's my final one like what what should I think you've got you've got an excellent just set of links and things on your Instagram page where I mean I there's a bunch of podcasts that are very I think beginner friendly right yeah. you can listen to it and you'll get a really good understanding of what it is if you want to understand the the inner you know international chess game that's there for you too um you know the speculation that's there for you too um but and so that that's great i was wondering if you if you had anything and you can send me the link and i'll, I'll post it for people too if you if you don't remember it off off bat the name of it um but if there's anything you think yo you should you should watch this also just on some culture yeah stuff. i mean like I said, on TikTok, I've been making a really um, um, concerted, deliberate effort to share uh, Sudanese creators who are just making things that don't have anything to do with the war. Yeah. Um, there's a there's one who, I I think she started making these videos after she was displaced from Khartoum. I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but her last video that I, that I shared is of uh two men making how, what do you call it in english it's like um it's like a gazebo okay like a Sudanese traditional gazebo but it's made using um palm fronds and the construction i mean this is something the rakuba is something i know deeply like just again it's part of like the culture right Mm. Um, and it's something that exists in various forms in every home, particularly village homes. Um, but I'd never seen it being made. And I'm sure so many Sudanese who live in major cities have never seen it being made. Mm. And this young woman made this video, and all of her videos are so aesthetically beautiful, just so mm. pleasing to the eye. Um, they have like an emotional aspect to them that I think transcends being Sudanese. I don't think it has anything to do with being Sudanese. She just, she was very skilled at presenting things in a way that make, that draw you in. And she just has this very short clip of them putting together this, this rakuba, this gazebo. And it was so fascinating and so beautiful. And, and, and so, yeah, so like I've been sharing this kind of content, I repost all of that. If you go to my repost on TikTok, you will find, mm. you know, people dancing, um, if traditional dances or just otherwise. Uh, like I said, this girl's videos where she shows like she's kind of like reflecting village life. Um, it's it's so nice, 
And I think it gives people a different perspective of Sudanese that they need, that they absolutely need. That makes a lot of sense, yeah, because I think, you know, I mean, even to bring it back to the beginning, um, you know, when I said, you know, five million people in danger of being, you know, extreme hunger, right? Again, that's five million, that person, five million of those accounts are possible. Five million people, these are all, again, at the end of the day, we are talking about people. Um, You said, I think, really brilliantly, I think it's a, a really maybe important way to understand this, is that essentially the government is fighting its people. Right. And, you know, totally. you you've said, OK, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Which one? Which one am I supposed to root for? Which general is supposed to root for? No, it's not one of the generals because peace talks are not happening. Ceasefires are not happening. Nobody from the outside is forcing the hand to make this happen. Who is suffering? It is the people. And it's always like that. This, this mm-hmm. is always the case. <clears throat> but also. People who live through these things are not numbers and they are not casualties and they are not family of casualties. They are people who sing, dance, do TikTok trends, make a gazebo. Yeah. I, I need to go watch this video now. You you've talked it up so much it's I gotta so see it. It's so great. But you know that 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 is what this is. And so I think both of those at the same time are necessary um Mm -hmm. i've kept you so long thank you so much um no i just wanted to thank you for this this is the first time that i have had a conversation about sudan that did not stop at the figures that did not just involve the bare bones facts who's bad who's not what are the give us the stats who you know, <clears throat> what are people doing? Actually, no, nobody has asked that question. <laughs> nobody has asked, what are people doing to survive? Mm-hmm. I have offered that information. Nobody's asking why, how soon these people are surviving or whether they want to. It's just, what are the generals doing and what's happening to them? What's happening to the people? It's never, what are the people doing? And they're doing so much. Um, So I just thank you for giving me the space to be able to talk about that, to be able to center the people who are the primary victims of of what's happening, who are suffering um, the most, who are bearing the brunt Mm. of what's happening, fully bearing the brunt of what's happening. Just thank you. Thank you for giving me the space. Thank you for treating me like a person. I know that's weird to say, but... This is the first time that I felt like a person talking about Sudan, as opposed to an outlet. And I really appreciate that. I'm going to give a very qualified thank you for saying that to me. I I appreciate that. Um, May you have many more opportunities to talk as a person. That is... (laughs) I... There are so many things you said today that were incredibly kind and I really don't like hearing. <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? Um, I don't like that at all. Mm-hmm. I don't ever want to be said, and I don't ever want anybody to say that to me ever again. Um, but yeah, um, no, for real. And I mean, in terms of centering, I mean, you're, you're doing that. You, you've been doing that. Like, that's part of the reason, I don't know if people saw the, the third slide that I posted on the IG, where you just see the wall of you making videos. It's like, this is, you. you've been doing this and- and people have been able to some, I mean, some of these, some of the updates you make, you know, no offense. Some of these updates are truly mundane, not yeah. much to report today, not much happening. Yeah. Um, some of them are heartbreaking. Some of them are good news, right? That somebody was found safe. Right. And, and that's, that's mm-hmm. what this is, but you know, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, you, you brought some of that, over here to me too. Uh, I feel like I, I learned a lot and you know, I didn't get any new facts or figures. Um, I learned about people and, and that's infinitely more, not just educational, but frankly interesting to me. Um, mm-hmm. But but for real, thank you. Um, 
to Sarah for coming through despite the flu. Please get better. And um, the door is always open. Please, anytime. The door is Thank always you. open. Come Thank back. You so come much. through. I really appreciate it. But take care. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. All right. Easy. Peace.